Hello, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu City. Today, Pastor Chad will speak on generosity with a message based on the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church. To follow along with the Life Notes, visit calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. I invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians 9 is our text. If you do not have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1150. That's page 1150. And you'll find 2 Corinthians 9. You'll be able to follow along with us. And as always, if you're in the room at any of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then take one. It is our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word, read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible, then uh, ask for one. Ask our service host or email us at calvaryaz.com. We'll be glad to get you a Bible because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, I'm excited about the Thanksgiving dinner that's coming up. Uh, we've been doing this for a number of years now. It is, look, it started out of the desire to take care of our widows, okay? And we just said, hey, we don't think the, the widows should be eating alone. On Thanksgiving, we're gonna have a dinner for them. And we realized that not everybody who's alone on Thanksgiving is a widow. And, and so we just said, hey, if you're alone on Thanksgiving, then we want you to come. We do want you to make reservations. Last year, we had about 200 people, which is our max at McCulloch. Uh, North Campus is hosting one as well. If they're closer to you, then that's fine. Uh, but uh, understand, and I just say this, it, it's for those who don't have anyone. So James says, James chapter one says, uh, this is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God that we should look after widows and orphans in their distress and to keep ourselves unstained from the world. Okay, so so that's part, of that, that's part of what we're doing is we're trying to take care of the widows and orphans. So if you're a single mom and you've got no family, you're, uh, you know, sorry, old people and you got no one to go with, uh, then come and have Thanksgiving with me, all right? That, that's kind of the invitation or Rick out at North Campus. Uh, we would love to host you and bless you and do that and the food's not gonna be bad. I'm not cooking it. Chagruz is. So uh, it's safe. And, and I'm just, uh, that's an invitation for you. But if you've got a life group, and you guys are like, hey, let's get together for Thanksgiving. No, let's go to the church. Don't do the church thing. If you're a life group and you guys got all the stuff, then you guys have your party, okay? And bring people along with you that don't have any place to go because that's what God wants us to do. So this is us trying to take care of our people. So if you qualify, man, sign up. If, if you don't, you come anyway, we'll love you. Uh, we'll just talk later. And... Uh, Nah, well, you're not going to say anything. We, we just, uh, we love people. Hey, the other thing I just got to mention, because uh, about everybody I, I talked to before the service uh, looked at me and said, what happened? <laughs> and, uh, and yes, I usually have facial hair like uh, for uh, 95, 98% of the time that I've been pastor here, uh, which is a lot. Uh, and, uh, and I just said, look, shaving mistakes happen. And when you have a shaving mistake happen, there's no going back, right? <laughs> Men, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if it goes, it all goes. And so it all went, and uh, it'll come back, uh, God willing. Uh, actually, if I never had to shave again, I'd be thankful. So uh, there's that. Anyway, hey, who are the risk takers in the room? Come on, let me see your hands. Okay. Yeah, you guys are the, the ones who like to parachute out of airplanes and bungee jump, and, and uh, you like to do crazy things. You want to, like, you know, stand on the edge of cliffs or do, you know, that kind of stuff. Or maybe you're just like, you know, in business, you're like, oh, I'm going to make the deal, and I'm going to take the risk, and I'm going to make it happen. You just kind of get a kick out of taking risks. And other people, not so much. But here's the thing. Life involves risk. You cannot avoid it. I mean, think about it. Marriage is a risk. It doesn't matter how well you think you know that other person, there is a chance they could go crazy. Okay, some of you have had that happen. Hopefully they go crazy and stay. Uh, you know, taking a new job is a risk. You think it's gonna be an improvement, you think it's gonna be better, but you don't know. Moving across the country is a risk. Having children, it's a risk. Uh, I mean, the only thing that's not a risk is at some point they're gonna break your heart. Uh, Eating out is risky, especially if you do it in a third world country. You should try that sometime. Um, 
hey, like I lead mission trips all over the world and people always ask me when we're getting ready to go, they go, is it safe? Is it safe? And, and my answer, I, sorry, I've rehearsed this because I get asked so many times. Uh, the riskiest part of your mission trip is driving to the airport. <laughs> Unless, of course, you decide you want to sit on the edge of a waterfall, you know, or, uh, oh, they're not showing it. So anyway, uh, it, it loses the effect that way. <laughs> or if you decide you want to walk with lions and hang out with, uh, you know, the cats, then it might be a little bit riskier than just driving to the airport. So uh, anyway, fun stuff. You don't have to do that if you go on a mission trip with me. It's just optional. So you have a risk-taking bent one way or another. You are either, you can get rid of the picture now. Uh, you're either, <laughs> no, one's, no one's paying attention if you leave the picture up there. See, whether you're a risk taker or not, it has an impact on those around you. It affects the people in your life. And, and life involves risk. And so I want you to, to do a little self-assessment real quick. I want you to rank yourself as a risk taker. And I'm only going to give you three options, okay? You've got to pick one of these options, and I'm going to ask you to share it with your neighbors. So think about this. Are you a high-stakes gambler? Uh, whether you gamble or not. Are you a high-stakes risk taker, gambler? Are you, you know, do you like moderate risk? Or are, do you always play the safe bet? Okay, high stakes, moderate, or safe bet? Okay, don't tell me. Tell the person sitting next to you. One of you. If, if no one's next to you, then interrupt someone around you. Find them. What are you? You don't want to answer. Okay. If you don't answer, you're probably safe bet. You know, that's probably the thing. So today we're kicking off the series, The Ripple Effect, and, and we want to ask you this, are you ready to take the risk of following Jesus? Are you ready to take the risk of obeying Jesus? Are you ready to take the risk of his plan for your life? Uh, see, whatever you decide is going to have an impact far beyond just you. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. You can follow along with me. Uh, and then I'll, we'll talk about it because it doesn't make sense just reading it unless you know the backstory. Now, it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints. For I know your readiness, of which I boast about you, to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia, that's where Corinth was, has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I am sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove to be empty in this matter so that you may be ready as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated to say nothing of you for being so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift and not as an exaction. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Okay, I'm going to stop right there and, and explain the story. Let's talk about the story. The, the story is this. This is the backstory. This is what makes sense of that that paragraph, because if you just read it and you don't know this story, you kind of go like, what's he talking about? So here's what he's talking about. The Jerusalem church is hurting. I mean, they're basically starving to death. The Jews there have persecuted them. They've lost their jobs. They've lost their wealth. Uh, they, are, they are under attack and oppression by the religious leaders in Israel. And, and so Paul has decided that he's going to take up an offering of the churches that he started. You know, he started a whole bunch of churches. That's, you know, most of the books, half the books in the New Testament are Paul writing to the churches that he started. And he's like, hey, we're going to take up an offering for Jerusalem. That sound good? We're going to take it up for the Jerusalem church. I mean, actually, we wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here if it weren't for the Jerusalem church and, and them sending us out and, and them doing all this stuff. So he, they, he's, he's like, hey, let's do this. And, and when he tells the Corinthian church about the offering, they are excited about it. We love that idea. That is such a great idea. But Paul knows them. And he knows that their intentions do not always equal their actions. Aren't you glad we don't have that issue? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he knows that. 
And, and so he writes to them and he says, hey, are you ready? Are you ready for this? In, in chapter eight, he has bragged about the Macedonian church and how they gave generously to the Jerusalem church out of their need, out of their lack, out of their poverty. They gave this offering and, and the, the Corinthian church is, is better off. They're, you know, they're kind of the upper middle class church in the New Testament churches. And he's like, hey, I've been bragging about you guys. Don't make me look like an idiot. Even better, don't make yourselves look like idiots because you know, that would be really, really embarrassing if I show up and you're not ready. And, I mean, and you even hear it. Paul's like, don't make me take the money from you. Right? And they said, exaction, I, I, you said you're gonna give. I don't make me go around and beg for it. Uh, because uh, I want you to be ready so you don't embarrass both of us. So Paul asked the Corinthians if they were ready for uh, co co contributing to the Jerusalem offering. And Paul is asking us today, are you ready? Are you ready to follow Jesus? I mean, if you've never made a commitment to, to Jesus as Lord of your life, you've never confessed him as your savior, you've never asked him to forgive your sins, you know, we, we want you to do that because you're not ready. You're not ready for eternity. You're not ready to, to give an account to God for your life because without Jesus and his forgiveness, you're unprepared for next. You know, uh, if you're a follower of Jesus, are you ready to proclaim your faith in baptism? You know, we will baptize you anytime, any place. There's water and a crowd. Okay, that's our offer. We'll do it. If the water's freezing and you still want to get in it, one of us will get in it with you. That's why we have youth pastors. And uh, <laughs> I used to get in the water when it was cold. But anyway, uh, no, the, the, I mean, that's the, that's the reality. We got, you know, we got a baptism over here. It's ready every weekend. We'd love to baptize you if you want to declare your faith. And I'll just tell you this. If that's something you know you need to do, we got Christmas Eve services coming up. Wouldn't that be a great way to te declare your faith to the world on Christmas Eve to a bunch of people who don't usually come to church that, hey, Jesus has changed my life. Think about it. Let us know. We'll be glad to do it. But if you want to do it, you don't want to wait till then, let us know. We'll be happy to baptize you. Are you ready for God to change your life? Are you, are you just tired of being stuck in that place, that same old place? You see, Paul knew the Corinthian Christians and he knew their struggles, and one of their obstacles to following Jesus was money and generosity. And some of us have that same struggle. And so, yes, we're talking about money and giving, and it was a stumbling block for the Corinthian believers, and it can be a stumbling block for us as well. Now, before you tune me out and ignore me and start looking at your phone, uh, let me just share with you the biblical principles of generosity, okay? Okay. The principles of biblical generosity as Calvary understands them. So if you're new to Calvary, uh, let me share these with you. If you've been around for a while, you've heard these before, I want to remind you of them as well. This is how we understand the scriptural teaching about giving. Okay, first of all, God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need your money. I mean, Psalm 24, 1 Corinthians 10, both declare the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If you read Genesis, chapter one, verse one, it says, in the beginning, God did what? Yeah, he created the heavens and the earth. Out of nothing, God made everything that is. So if God can speak the sun, moon, and stars into existence, if he can make life and breathe life into us, do you really think God's gonna go broke? I mean, you know, God doesn't need our money. He is sufficient. He created everything. He owns everything. He doesn't need your money. And anyone who says God does need your money is selling something. And it's not the good news. So God doesn't need your money. And the church doesn't need your money. Yeah, some of you are starting to like this, aren't you? You know, if you're new, you're like, oh, this is good. But uh, just no, we just wait. We're not done yet. So... The church doesn't need your money. Okay, so the church is the bride of Christ. The New Testament, you know, displays this picture that Jesus is the groom and the church is the bride. Uh, in fact, in Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Okay, so, so Jesus loves the church. It's his bride. Now, Jesus is God in the flesh. He is God the Son. So Jesus owns everything. Uh, he created everything. And, and so he, he doesn't need our money. And do you think 
that Jesus, his love for the church, that he's going to take care of his bride? Some of you are like, I don't know. What kind of husband are you? Uh, Anyway, yeah, I mean, he's going to take care of his bride. He's not going to let her suffer. Now, it doesn't mean that God's going to give the church everything that we want, but he will provide for our needs, okay? He's not going to indulge all of our selfish desires, and we are selfish people. Uh, he is going to meet the needs of the church. So the church doesn't need your money. Now, we will share ministry needs. We will share opportunities for you to support and help. We will invite you to be generous and to pray about what God would have you to give, always with the understanding that God is the one who provides, and, and so the church doesn't need your money. So biblical principles, right? God doesn't need your money. The church doesn't need our money. Some of you are going, why are we talking about money? Because... We need to give. We need to give. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, you believe he was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then uh, understand that you need to give. Did you hear 2 Corinthians 9, 6? Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Okay, those are the words of the Apostle Paul. He's echoing the words of Jesus. He's echoing the words of the Proverbs of the Old Testament. He's, he's just saying this over and over and over again. Uh, we need to give. And Paul is talking about reciprocity, that you reap what you sow. Not yet, not yet John. Just hang out on the side over there. And uh, sorry, I'm looking over going, whoa, that was quick. Uh, So, look, you reap what you sow. If you want more love in your life, what do you need to do? You need to love. Yeah, if you want more love in your life, you need to love others, which Jesus kind of encourages us to do. If if you want more mercy in your life, what do you need to give? Yeah, Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. If you want more encouragement in your life, what should you do to others? Yeah, critique does not breed encouragement. Can, can I just say that? It's, it, you know, nagging does not produce encouragement. Uh, complaining does not, in, you know, produce encouragement. If you want more encouragement in your life, encourage other people. If you want more blessings in your life, what should you do? Yeah, you guys are starting to get this. Uh, look, we need to give so that we can receive more of God's blessings. If we are cheap and stingy and we sow sparingly, Uh, how are we going to reap? Sparingly. If we are generous and sow bountifully or we sow abundantly or we sow extravagantly, what are we going to reap? Yeah, all those those different answers are like, I don't know. One of those. That's what we're going to reap. So I want you to understand this before I get to this uh, illustration that you hopefully will love. All right? We preach about money as a church for your benefit, okay? We're, we're sharing this for your benefit. I, I know it, it, some of you are like, well, you guys want us to give. Yeah, you're right. As your pastor, I want you to give. You know why I want you to give? Because I want you to live in the joy and the blessings of Jesus. And, 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 and here's the thing. If you're gonna you know, be stingy, if you're gonna sow sparingly, then I know you're gonna be depriving yourself of the blessings of God as opposed to if you are generous and, and you give generously, then there's gonna be all kinds of blessings in your life. Okay, this is how it works. And that's why I say, are you willing to, are, you know, are you ready to follow Jesus? Are you ready to be obedient to him? Because this is what the word of God is teaching us. And so if you get this truth, it will change your life. So, Here's the question that I want you to wrestle with, and and it's going to lead into the illustration. Is your life a river or a reservoir? So, now I need John. Okay, John is going to help me out. Uh, He looks good in our security team shirt, doesn't he? Yeah. So, John is going to play the part of God. Let me be really clear. He's not God. He's just playing him on TV. So, uh, so. John, you're, you're going to take that, uh, okay. So he's going to lift up what is the jug of blessings, okay? 
This is us. This is our lives right here. And here, and, he, and God pours blessings into our life. You know, all the food you eat, all the shelter that you live in, your house, your, your cars, uh, all, the, uh, all the good things in your life are from God. And God fills us up. To, and we would love to, you guys like receiving blessings? You, like, you love God pouring those blessings into your life. And we're like, God, yes, thank you for all these good blessings. That's why we you know, celebrate Thanksgiving. Now it's a national holiday. But we're gonna, and, and we're like, look at how good God is. He's just pouring all this into our lives. And, and then it gets to a point where God stops pouring into our God, did you stop pouring into our lives because you don't love us? No. No, he didn't. He didn't stop pouring into our lives because he stopped caring about us. He didn't stop pouring into our lives because he didn't want to bless us anymore. Why did he stop pouring? Yeah. The vessel is full. We can't receive. God has more blessings to give. He never runs out. But we can't receive them unless we do what? Unless we release the blessings and we give. And see, what happens is when we give, when we start you know, sharing with others, and we start supporting the ministries of God, and we start seeing other people in need, and we bless them, then what ends up happening is we create room in our life. Go ahead, you can fill it up. And God can pour more blessings into our lives. We can never give more than God can fill us up. And so it's this process where we're meant to let the blessings pass through us and not just stay in us. Now what happens is a lot of times we just do this because we like the stuff God gives us. And we decide we're gonna be selfish because we wanna hang on to them. And, and what happens is two things. One is the blessings stop being poured into our life and then secondly, the water in there stagnates. It gets stale, it gets nasty. And, and by the way, some of you are thinking, well, I'm generous because, you know, I, I supported that charity with a, a small donation. And, oh, I, you know what, I tipped that one waitress really good. And uh, I bought Girl Scout cookies. Does that even count as, like... <laughs> and, you know, and what the problem is that a lot of us think we're being generous, and yet all we're doing is just let little bursts out instead of living a life that is pouring out the blessings of God that we've given uh, to others. Now, here's the real tragedy. I'm going to turn this off now because some of you have to go to the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> what you see? Yeah, yeah. Anybody gets up now, it's like, oh, okay, we know. Here's, here's the thing. Reservoirs can be really good as long as they release the water uh, that they've got in them. If they don't release the water, they stagnate and die. There's a river in the Holy Land, uh, Jordan River, that flows into a sea, a body of water. What's it called? The Dead Sea. Because there's no outlets in the Dead Sea. You know why it's called the Dead Sea? Because there's nothing living in it. Actually, they found some like, microorganisms that like salt. So they're, they're there. But there's no fish in the Dead Sea. You can't like go in there and drink the water. You can't, it's all, it's dead. Uh, and thank you, you can move, you go ahead and take that away, John. Thank you. Hey, didn't he do a great job playing God? John, don't let it go to your head, okay? Um, here's the thing. If we are selfish, then we become like the Dead Sea. Our lives stagnate. They, they, nothing can really live there. There's no joy, there's no life, there's no peace. All of that is there, and, 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 and so we just become this, we become dead on the inside. And some of you may wonder why God isn't blessing your life more. Some of you may complain that your life is spiritually stagnant or stale. And this could be one of those reasons because you were created by God to bless others and you've been blessed by God to bless others. And remember, Paul says, whoever sows sparingly reaps and whoever sows generously reaps yeah so are you ready to risk following Jesus trusting his word to inform your decisions and guide your life see I'm just gonna say this no matter your risk level whether you are a high stakes gambler whether you like moderate risk or whether you want to play it safe generosity is the safest investment 
Now, it may sound incredibly, you know, risky to you to be generous. Malachi chapter 3 in the Old Testament uh, uh, says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, says the Lord. And see if I will not pour out such a blessing from heaven that you will not have room for all of it. Okay, God actually throws down the gauntlet to his people and he says, would you trust me in this? Would you just trust me and see if I won't bless you beyond what you know? And, and by the way, in case you're like really freaking out right now, tithing, it means 10% of your income. 10% of what God gives you, he wants us to give back to him as a way of saying thank you and I trust you. Thank you and I'm following you. And some of you are sitting here going, oh, of course, that's so easy. I, I do that and I know that. And others of you, if you're not tithing, it's an incredibly risky thing. At least it feels risky. But I'm just trying, I just wanted to let you know you can trust God. And the real risk is trying to bless yourself without God's help. Okay, the real risk is you trying to take care of yourself instead of relying on God to be the one to bless you. If we sow generously, if we share our blessings abundantly, we cannot lose. See, God promises to bless us in measure to our generosity. Now, what God doesn't promise is to bless us with the things that we want to be blessed with. We are so shallow, aren't we? Because so many people just want more money and to feel better. And, and, uh, and there's nothing wrong with more money and there's nothing wrong with feeling better. But uh, both of those things are temporary and we want the temporary blessings when our heavenly father wants to give us things that last eternally. You know, he wants to bless us with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. He wants to bless us with purpose and, and with love in all the different aspects of our life. He wants to, to give us a reason to get up in the morning and to celebrate and to worship him. And, and so all these things God wants to give us and we always want to go, well, can I have the, the cheap stuff, God? And here's the thing. We get to determine how much God blesses us because the one who sows generously reaps generously. We get to determine how much God blesses us. We do not get to determine how God blesses us. He doesn't give us that option in scripture. He gives us the option of how much we get blessed. He does not give us the option of what manner of blessing it comes in. So when I talk about a safe investment, it is a safe investment for eternity. It is not a way to make money in this world. Okay, now God blesses some people with money because they know what to do with it. All right, but uh, I'm just telling you, we choose the amount of blessing, God chooses the type of blessing, and generosity is the safest investment. Um, now, you may or may not know this as well. I do not know what any person at Calvary gives to Calvary. Okay, I don't know. None of the pastors on our staff have access to that financial information. And we're not gonna get access to that financial information because we're all a bunch of sinners too and we don't wanna use that to favor some people other than, more than others because God actually warns against that, okay? So I don't know what anybody in this, in this church gives unless you tell me and if you tell me, I don't trust you. <laughs> all right, you know, if you're trying to gain influence, I was like, well, I can't go validate that, so I don't know. So here's the thing. I know what, my family, my immediate family gives. I don't know what my kids give either. I know what Meralda and I do. And, he, and here's the thing. We believe God's word. We're gonna take the risk of trusting God. And so we tithe from our income, from the gross income, okay? Just in case some of you always like to ask that question. And we generously support the Limitless Campaign. And we currently sponsor Six Children of Compassion, and we're generous towards wait staff, community endeavors. We help kids with scholarships, uh, all those different kinds of things. And we do that not because we have to. We do that because I believe God and I want to be ready for when I meet Jesus face to face. I believe God and I want more of his blessings in my life right now. And I want to give an account to my Lord and my Savior whom I worship not just with my words, but with my deeds and my resources. Paul asks us if we're ready. I'm ready. The question is, are you ready? 
As your pastor, I'm praying that you are. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We love you because you loved us first and you sent Jesus into this world to rescue us from our sin, uh, to save us from our brokenness. God, you invested the blood of Jesus into saving us. And we just want to say thank you and we want to express our trust in you and we want to receive your blessings by choosing to live lives of generosity towards you. So God, I pray that you would speak to us. Your servants are listening and we will follow you in simple obedience, as risky as it may feel. God, we believe we can trust you and so we're gonna act accordingly because you're the God who loves, you're the God who redeems, you're the God who saves and you are our Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. I love Chad's point that God doesn't need your money. The church doesn't need your money. However, we Christians need to give. Remember, generosity is the safest investment. If you'd like to exercise generosity by supporting the ministry of Calvary, I encourage you to check us out on the web at calvaryaz.com. There you'll find out more about our church, have the opportunity to listen to past messages, support us financially, and connect with us through our online connect card. Well. That'll do it for today. I hope you'll join us again next week. Bye-bye. Are you looking for a way to dive deeper into scripture and make it a part of your daily routine? Check out Calvary's Word for the Day daily devotional videos. Visit calvaryaz.com forward slash D-E-V-O and sign up to receive these three to five minute devotionals right to your inbox each day. Our team of pastors and leaders share meaningful insights from the Bible to equip and encourage you in your faith journey. Don't miss out on this opportunity to grow in your relationship with God and connect with the community of believers. Sign up today and start receiving your daily dose of scripture.